Jersey. A private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by lawyers Diane and Emmanuel and the online legal reference elaw.com. purchase we make, and most of us will be paying for it for years. I'm Raymond Brown, and I'm talking about an automobile. So what happens when the ride of our dreams turns out to be the car from hell? Well, here in New Jersey, we're told, there is somewhere to turn, and Sandy King is here to tell us where we can take that sour yellow citrus fruit on wheels. Raymond, it starts with something fittingly called the Lemon Law, and it's not unique to New Jersey. There are lemon laws in all 50 states. But the Center for Auto Safety has called New Jersey's law the second best in the country. And though the way the state handles complaints and the law itself are not without their critics, they can mean real help when you need it in a culture that really cares about its cars. You could buy a brand new Model T for less than $300. People gave up walking, and cars replaced horses as a principal mode of transportation. It was the start of America's romance with the automobile. And whether it was comedy or crime, or a new kind of commerce, the car very quickly moved center stage. Fifteen million families bought them by 1927. By the 50s, the car was far more than a way to get from one place to another. Chill out. What? Chill out. I just love it when guys chill out. A source of status and glamour. The quintessential American way to go. And for most of us, the first or maybe second biggest spending we'll ever do. Let me take a guess. You're thinking you can't afford this car. Well... $45,000. What? Okay. <laughs> Didn't mean to frighten you with that. That's what's called sticker shock, man. So is it any wonder that when our investment goes bad... Put back the car! ...breaks down... It's your emergency! What we want is justice. Here it is. We won't tell you anything in that back seat. And that was the idea of the Lemon Law. Constitution, there would be official help from the government. Our lemon law is the best in the country. From the courts. We get thousands of calls each year, approximately 6,000 calls. We get hundreds and hundreds of written complaints, but 300 individuals actually have an application that is then forwarded to the Office of Administrative Law, and that's where they get a hearing. They get their day in court. And whether they go that route or they hire a lemon lawyer, the idea is that consumers shouldn't be stuck with those chronically crippled cars. The sour lemon, in short, could become lemonade. And that's apparently how it worked for Raul Ortiz. I went in and took a look at them and uh, fell in love with them, you know, right from the get-go and bought one that same day. A Dodge Durango RT, Raul's idea of the dream car. And for the first six months, it was smooth riding. Then, he says, the breakdowns began. Our first was uh, hesitation with the transmission. Then the whining noises started with, with the drivetrain. And that, he says, was just the beginning of a seemingly endless round of repairs. I mean, every time it happened, I would call him immediately, and 
you say, look, I'm taking this thing back, fix it, fix it, fix it. I don't know how many times I lost count. But the paperwork says it was 14 times. Every single time I have to call in, I got to look my, I got to call my boss, tell him I'm going to be late. So it was a hassle. Every single time I had to do that. So it was, it was, I mean, my lifestyle was, was wrecked from just because of the thing out of the truck. And maybe that's why a jury not only ruled with Ortiz, which meant a buyback of his truck, but also awarded him cash damages. After a three-day trial, the jury found that indeed this vehicle was a lemon, and there was also a violation of the New Jersey Consumer Fraud Act and awarded him $10,000 in damages, which under New Jersey Consumer Fraud gets trebled or tripled uh, by three, so the 10000 would then become $30,000. And apparently there are so many lemons that firms like the one representing Ortiz do nothing but lemon work. To date, I can estimate that we've helped 25, 30,000 consumers with problems that they've had uh, with their vehicle. But then we have our own statistics which show over $44 million in refunds to consumers. And that's just for the cases that have come through this state office. Private lemon law firms claim they can do even better. The lawyers for Ortiz point to him as proof. I didn't think it was going to go this far. It, it took two years, but uh, it, it was well worth it, you know. But Daimler Chrysler, in a written statement, blasted Ortiz for not going through state-run arbitration, and with an appeal still pending, says the jury's finding of fraud is unsupported by any evidence. The statement insists that the Ortiz vehicle was fully repaired, but does not dispute the claim that his truck was a lemon. And if Ortiz wins on appeal, there will be a new truck in his future. The $20,000 or $15,000 or $30,000 or $80,000 that people get refunded, that's important to them. A car is an essential thing. And with the lemon law, ready? it may also be a less risky ride. about Raul Ortiz and his Dodge Durango. Well, the Chrysler appeal is still pending, so he's still waiting for both the buyback and his $30,000 in damages. And if it comes, he says he won't be buying another Durango or another Dodge. Still, if complaints filed with federal traffic safety officials are, in fact, an accurate gauge of which car is most likely to be a lemon, the Durango's nowhere near the top of the list. Based on a ratio of the number of complaints to the number of sales, the list gives the Subaru Impreza the dubious distinction of being lemon number one, followed by the Infiniti i35, the Audi A4, and the Ford Focus. And though the Dodge Caravan ranked number 21 on the lemon list, the Dodge Durango didn't even make the top 25. More on lemons and the laws that change the game for their buyers when we come back, so stay with us. to get a lousy car sunk out, you have a certain amount of time in order to return it back to the car dealership. Um, I think it has to do with cars. Um, and um, that's it. That's all I know. The lemon law. Yeah, it, uh, it's about cars, new cars. If you have a prob same problem two or three times, you're entitled to uh, give it back and get a new car or whatever, something like that. The lemon law or for cars, yeah. I know what it is. If you sell somebody a car and then knowing that it's And here to help us sort through the law that's supposed to turn your lemon into lemonade, Robert Silverman, a lawyer who represents car buyers who say they're lemon law victims. Kevin McKeon, who defends car manufacturers in lemon law suits. And in New York, acting director of the Division of Consumer Affairs, Jeff Burstein. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Robert, let me start with you. At the time that lemon laws were introduced first in New Jersey and around the country, it was hailed as a breakthrough, as a concept that would really advance consumer protection in a very important area. Overall, would you say that the idea of lemon laws generally and specifically in New Jersey have lived up to those expectations? Absolutely. Absolutely. Lemon laws are very important. Before there were lemon laws, clients would have to go by themselves against a manufacturer or dealership, and the dealership or manufacturer would basically say, go pound sand, take us to court. 
realizing that it's infeasible to go to court unless you can have a lawyer by your side for free. Kevin, your clients are manufacturers, but I assume they also regard themselves as serious citizens, uh, corporate citizens. Do you think, as a whole, they hail lemon laws? Well, of course, in any case uh, where someone has a problem, the manufacturers want to help their consumer. They want to help uh, their customer and keep that customer forever. So they want to help try to. Uh, but would manufacturers see lemon laws as the way to do it, or would manufacturers see another process as more likely to produce good results? Well, there's uh, a number of ways that they can go in New Jersey. So the lemon law uh, is something that they're aware of. accepted. Actually, before the lemon law, there was also federal law that helped out uh, consumers where uh, attorney's fees could be awarded to a successful claimant uh, in the discretion of the court. So even before lemon laws, there were laws that would help uh, the consumers. But before we do, could you, let me ask Jeff the same question, since your role involves the administration of the law from the state point of view. Would you say overall it's been an addition to consumer protection with respect to automobiles? Absolutely. Uh, this is a program that's been in effect uh, with the State Division of Consumer Affairs for approximately 16 years. Uh, we've recovered uh, approximately $45 million in restitution for consumers who uh, have been harmed in the purchase of uh, new cars. So we think it's been a resounding success and added to the previously existing statutory remedies. Now, a consumer who comes to Consumer Affairs with a complaint about a car, uh, a lemon complaint, at least in their mind, uh, do they have a lawyer in that process or would they come without a lawyer? That is the consumer's choice. They certainly uh, are free to either have, an lawyer, have a lawyer represent them in the administrative proceeding. They can consult with a lawyer but not have the attorney actually uh, appear at the hearing, or they can do it pro se, individually, without an attorney. And very many of the consumers who choose our administrative process through our Lemon Law Unit uh, go themselves without any legal counsel and are quite successful. In the state process, do you pay for or supply a lawyer to a consumer? No, we don't. Okay. But the consumer can recover attorney's fees if he or she uh, brings a lawyer to assist them at the administrative process. If they are successful, attorney's fees are a component of the recovery beyond the basic lemon law remedies. Now, Robert, let me ask you for a moment to step out of your role as an individual lawyer and put you in the legislature or maybe as the governor. Um, would you change the, uh, the question of representation in terms of whether Consumer Affairs paid for guaranteed payment to or supplied lawyers in this process? Well, no, that, that's a misconception, I believe. There's always fee shifting. Whether you go through the Office of Administrative Law, you go through uh, a lot of the manufacturers' informal dispute procedures, or as an option, you go through the courts. If you prevail, the manufacturer must pay the consumer legal fees. It's really just a question of which tribunal fits the case and, and, and the person. As uh, I believe in the Office of Administrative Law, they handle perhaps 300 cases a year. They've got to be presumptive clear lemon law cases before they're even heard. Okay, let me take you out of the legislature and say your cousin, your friend, someone says, I have this problem. And even if you were not available, would you urge them to get counsel on their own, even in the process of selecting which remedy to seek? Absolutely. It's free. And any good lemon lawyer will represent a consumer for free. If by free, you mean it's a contingent fee. So if there's a recovery, they get paid? Not a contingent fee at all. It's fee shifting, which means if we prevail for a consumer, the manufacturer must pay the legal fees of the consumer. If we lose, we don't get paid. So it's it's a win-win situation for a consumer. They lose, they pay nothing to us. When they win, the manufacturer's got to pay the legal fees. Kevin, we keep talking about manufacturers, but I'm not sure that everybody who's watching would know whether it's the manufacturer or the dealer who is normally the responding party when there are continued complaints about a car and a person saying they've got a lemon. Right, well, for, first of all, actually, from the get-go, there's the new car lemon law, which is only against manufacturers. There's also a used car lemon law which is against the dealer. So if you're dealing with a new car, you're dealing with only the manufacturer, really, unless you go through state court and maybe there's some pendant or ancillary case you have against the dealer, such as consumer fraud or something like that. But, but let me ask you, of the, of the people over the years that I've talked to individuals, this is just anecdotal, most have focused their attention on the dealer. And I'm not a specialist in the area, but people say, well, the dealer didn't respond or the dealer didn't fix it or the mechanic wasn't 
incompetent or wasn't straight about the problem. It seems so the focus of attention and the, the key interaction is between the sales unit, the retailer, and the customer and not the manufacturer. Um, is that the perception many people have and why is that perception? That's definitely a perception and of course you know, man, uh, manufacturers go through the dealers. Uh, the dealers are the first uh, line of uh, repairing a vehicle. Most manufacturers have a system where you go to a dealer first, uh, maybe the selling dealer, and hopefully they'll fix it. And if, if you don't like that particular dealership, or f for whatever reason, you can go to another dealership. But why wouldn't the manufacturers as a group say, it's unreasonable for us to have to deal with problems which are frequently the result of a failure to a dealer to respond effectively to the problem? Well, uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, from the manufacturer's perspective, under Lemon Law, only the manufacturer can be sued. Uh, the dealer can't be made. Is that a fair? Is that a good rule? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think the manufacturers necessarily think so because uh, you could have a, a mechanic or a couple of mechanics, uh, a couple of bad apples at a dealer that just don't get the problem solved. And unfortunately, it's the manufacturer that uh, gets on the hook for that. Jeff, let me ask you this. What is your view about this issue of the dealer versus the manufacturer? Uh, the focus in the statute is on the manufacturer, but it seems that at least the perception of many folks is it's the dealer who isn't responding to the problem. Well, it's the manufacturer that manufactures the lemon. And so that's why the legislature placed responsibility ultimately on the manufacturer to remedy the problem. Now, the dealer gets involved in, in terms of uh, making repairs, and there are provisions in the lemon law that require the consumer to attempt to have the authorized dealer uh, make repairs before their rights are triggered under the lemon law statute. But let me ask you a question about the trigger then, and then I'll let go of this point, but it does seem interesting to me, and that is that aren't some of the triggers under the statute related to the number of times a car is unsuccessfully serviced or the amount of time lost because of unsuccessful service? The focus there seems to be on service, although the manufacturer is the party responsible. Well, the manufacturer authorizes dealers uh, and other shops to uh, repair their cars. Uh, if you go to some unauthorized dealer, you're not going to be able to invoke your rights under the Lemon Law. Uh, but if your uh, vehicle has been out of service because of a nonconformity for 20 days or more, or if you've made uh, three attempts to have it fixed at an authorized dealer, authorized by the manufacturer, and that's unsuccessful, there's a, a presumption that your car is a lemon. Robert, you smiled when I asked this question about the relationship of the retailer to the manufacturer. A absolutely. It's, it all comes down to not just the manufacturer of the lemon, but the manufacturers decided that they're going to have independent franchises act as agents for them to perform the repairs. So their agents are the dealer. So every act of the dealership and failing to repair the lemon, whether it's due to a, a failure of an attempt or a defect that can't be fixed, is the, responsible, the, the responsibility of the manufacturer. And if the manufacturer doesn't like it, they're going to go back after the dealerships. So you think it is fair because ultimately the dealer is effectively acting for the manufacturer? For, for the purposes of the consumer, the dealer is the manufacturer. They all believe that the dealership is, for instance, Chrysler. And they're acting on behalf of Chrysler. When they fail, Chrysler fails. It's also very hard to get a hold of the manufacturer or get the manufacturer to intervene because of corporate downsizing. There's less people out there who can help. And most of the times when consumers call these helplines, they're told, go back to your dealership. Try another dealership. We're really sorry. Here's an extended warranty. But there's just not enough people working, for instance, for Chrysler to help out these consumers. So the dealerships are where they go. Kevin, let me ask you this question, and maybe this is an inside question in terms of manufacturing, but maybe another way to look at this issue we've been discussing is how often is the fundamental problem a unsolvable design or manufacturing problem, and how often is it a failure to effectively respond to the needs of the consumer and get a proper fix for whatever is at risk? I think for most cars, there is a fix, uh, whatever it may be, whether it is just a mechanic that can't get it right or, or not. They were on the lemon case. Yeah, well, there, there are, and uh, that happens, and that's why, you know, that's why there is the lemon law. Uh, again, the manufacturers are aware of that. They deal with that all the time. Getting back to what I was saying before with the dealers, uh, they're the first line uh, of implementing the warranty, but beyond that, if you need to get uh, someone beyond the dealer involved, uh, many manufacturers, including, for example, Daimler Chrysler, have district managers, and you can get them involved and, and get someone from Daimler Chrysler or any other manufacturer involved to help out and try to get the problem solved. I mean, that's the whole intent of the, of the Lemon Law. Uh, in the first paragraph of the Lemon Law, uh, it, this legislature says it's the intent to have 
uh, the warrant team enforced and cars fixed within a reasonable period of time. So that's the whole intent. And there's a plea from you to the legislature or the governor's office in the state of Rhode Island. Would you change any aspect of the law, including this question of how responsibility is allocated between manufacturers or retailers? Um, I, w I wouldn't unless uh, there was a, sp a special clause or a section that would say that the dealer can be brought in under certain circumstances that would have So you to might make some adjustments over the dealer potentially becoming. Yeah, I, I don't think that's a, a major issue in most cases. I mean, it, it, in, a, in a lemon law type case, it's a situation where there's a problem with the vehicle. And like I said, if it's something from the get-go that maybe the, the dealer can't handle from the beginning, then either you go to another dealer that you think might help or you go to the manufacturer and hopefully they will help you. Uh, and they should help you, and they do help you. Right. So that you wouldn't change the lemon law at all if you had the, the authority or the power to do so? Uh, there are ways you could probably draft it a little better, make it a little clearer. And there's a quick settlement. There, well, there's also a dichotomy between going through the administrative uh, uh, judges, the Division of Consumer Affairs. Uh, there are certain guidelines there as opposed to uh, going through the courts. And you know, when, when you first have a problem, the consumer and the manufacturer don't know where it's going to go, and different rules ultimately apply to both that it can get crazy. Are, are you satisfied otherwise that the law is perfect? Would it be any change you make to the limit? I think we have a great limit law in New Jersey. I wouldn't make a change at all. I think that consumers, those who get better information with regard to their options of where they should or shouldn't file their claims, and consumers should clearly know that they should have an attorney represent them because they don't have to pay for it. Now, Jeff, I know that you're in charge of administering the program and you do other things. Are there any changes that you would make or recommend? Well, Ray, we have uh, two bills which the division has supported that would amend the lemon law in ways we think are positive. Uh, right now, there is a cap of 18,000 miles, uh, and if you go over that cap, the lemon law does not apply unless the car has been out of service for 20 days or more. And there is a bill uh, presently in the legislature that would increase the 18,000 mile uh, cap to 24,000, and that's something our agency has supported given the usage uh, uh, of drivers in New Jersey of their vehicles. The other bill that uh, also would amend the Lemon Law that the division has supported and presently is in the legislature as well would amend the provision that essentially requires uh, giving the manufacturer three opportunities to fix the problem before the consumer has the right to uh, process the claim administratively. Uh, the bill would provide that if the problem is such that it is likely to cause substantial injury or even death to the passenger, uh, then you don't need to uh, go back multiple occasions to the uh, authorized uh, dealer to get the car repaired. One time is enough in that set. Yeah, so we're running through the time, so let me ask Robert, uh, are there any unusual areas of coverage besides new and used cars that folks might not know about that are relevant to the limit law? Absolutely. First of all, it's very important for consumers to know this is a big misconception. It's not a period of elim elim elimination if they go over 18,000 miles. The first complaint must be before the earlier of two years or 18,000 miles. You could have 100,000 miles and still have a claim. And even if you're not covered by the lemon law, there's still attorney fee shifting, and you can have a claim for either a refund or cash damages uh, with free legal representation. Well, I want to thank all of you for being with us. Uh, we should, of course, thank Robert and Kevin and Jeff Bernstein. Uh, that's it for this edition of Due Process. But we'll be back next week for another close look at law and social justice. Till then, for Sandy King and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching.
for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, a private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual and online legal reference, elaw.com.